Thanks, Helen. Well, the, I'm really excited about um, this particular lecture. As we've been saying all week long, uh, Trent Batson, who was our founder and president, retired in uh, the fall last year. And while we certainly supported his decision to retire, we were also a little bit sad about the fact that we wouldn't have him um, in our community in the same way. And you've seen over the course of the conference how many times he's been referenced and how often um, his work is discussed. And we're very happy that he continues to be part of our community, even in his retirement. Um, this conference and the, the planning of this conference was really orchestrated by Kate Coleman from the University of Melbourne and sadly she was not able to be here and as we've been working through thinking about how we would transition able to our able 2.0 or whatever the next stage is Kate proposed that we have um, not only a Batson lecture but also a Batson scholars program that we're hoping to roll out in the coming year and of course the board all thought that was a fabulous idea and quickly started to plan the Batson lecture for this conference. We didn't have to think very long or hard about who we would invite to be our very first Batson lecturer. Susan Kahn has been a long uh, time and original member, I think founding board member of ABLE and um, was chair of the board as well um, just before I became chair and has just worked tirelessly on behalf of the organization. Whenever I um, have a question about governance or planning, I call Susan. When I have a question about what should I do in my class, I call Susan. When I wanna go on a lovely hike in Edinburgh, I call Susan, who I know also knows where all of the great places to eat are and will get me the most fabulous high tea after that hike <laughs> that we can enjoy together. Um, so this was a really exciting thing that to have Susan offer the first Batson lecture to really honor the work, not just of Trent Batson, but also of Judy Williamson Batson, who was our vice president, um, and who together with Trent worked tirelessly to ensure the success of ABLE. And um, I will say that on my Facebook feed every now and again, I get, you know, you've got some memories. And often those memories are photos from ABLE conferences. And just recently one came up with Judy and Kate and myself and Shane Sutherland, which was just um, a wonderful memory to, to reflect back on. So now the official part of, of Susan, you've heard what a fabulous person she is. Um, here's the, the official um, blurb. So Susan joined Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis in 1998 as director of the Urban University's Portfolio Project, a six campus <laughs> national project that produced the first generation of electronic institutional portfolios. When I first started to go to e-portfolio conferences, actually they weren't really e-portfolio conferences, we were at educational conferences where there were e-portfolio conversations. I was always, so I was, you know, this new, newly minted PhD, just starting my job, and always Susan was at the center um, of the conversation with a number of other people because she was doing this work right early on from the start. She currently serves as IUPUI's Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Director of the campus's ePortfolio Initiatives. In this role, she strives to support student and faculty development to enable students, departments, schools, and the institution to document student learning of key collegiate abilities and skills and to demonstrate institutional accountability through the annual campus performance report and a variety of other reports and studies. She also has just finished shepherding or is on her way to finishing uh, their accreditation report, which as many of you know is no small feat. So she's quite a force. Before joining IUPUI, Dr. Kahn directed a University of Wisconsin system-wide faculty development office that led initiatives focused on effective teaching and learning and on expanding campus's capacity to support teaching and learning. She simultaneously served as senior academic planner for the UW system, leading and staffing a wide range of statewide academic initiatives and a special assistant to the system's senior vice president for academic affairs. She has published, presented, and consulted frequently on faculty development, assessment, and electronic portfolios. A native of New York City, she holds a bachelor's degree from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, 
and MA and PhD degrees from the University of Wisconsin, all in English literature, and enjoys team teaching the senior capstone seminar in IUPUI's Department of English each spring. She shares her work fearlessly and generously. She is a great mentor and a fabulous friend. Please join me in welcoming Susan Kahn. Good morning, everyone. I almost don't know what to say after that introduction. Um, thank you very much, Tracy. That really was lovely. I'm very impressed with myself at the moment. <laughs> All right. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, Thank you, Tracy, for that lovely introduction. I, I truly am honored to be invited to give the inaugural Trent Batson Lecture. I'd like to thank the Board of Directors of ABLE and the conference planners for thinking of me. Um, I thank Trent for founding ABLE. I wish that he could have been here today. This organization has been crucial to what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Part of that is the legitimization of ePortfolios on my campus and others. Since its founding in 2009, ABLE has been crucial in moving the national conversation about ePortfolios forward. It has been crucial to the existence of a national conversation and helping us all be more intentional and sophisticated in our thinking about and use of e-portfolios for teaching and learning. It has certainly helped us to make progress on my campus, uh, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, um, help, hence my title, Getting Better All the Time. Um, which actually in part pays homage to the 50th anniversary of the release of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, um, bringing us back to our opening keynote by uh, Tom Black of Stanford. In this case, I'm talking about these Beatles, not the other kind of Beatles. Our topic today and for the and our theme for the conference is making the case. And one of the things that I've learned in my over 30 years serving in higher education in various capacities is that when you want to make the case, a very good strategy is to go to the people whose support you're going to need and ask their advice about how to make the case or how to implement the initiative. And as they give you that advice, they often convince themselves and uh, they join your side. So I'd like to talk to you this morning about an ePortfolio mission task force. It's a sort of case study of making the case and an ePortfolio initiative mission statement that we developed at IUPY this past academic year. I believe that both the task force and the statement have helped us make the case and will en enable us to continue to make the case for ePortfolios at I IUPY. Our process could easily be adapted to other institutions. So on the tables, there are copies of our mission statement. And I'm going to give you all a, mission, a moment to take a look at that so that you'll have a little bit of context for what I'm talking about this morning. Okay, has everyone had a chance to at least glance at it? One of the reasons I thought that this was worth talking about is that when we started working on this, we couldn't find an example of a mission statement for any portfolio initiative 
we found on e-portfolio websites at various institutions statements of purpose, but nothing explicitly conceived as a mission statement with a vision, values, strategies, and so forth. Now, recently I have seen a mission statement at Virginia Tech, and um, is Mark here? Yeah, well, I would be very interested to know how that came about, Mark. Um, so there, there is that one. And actually, this statement is not even up on our website yet. We need to do that. Um, the, our ePortfolio initiative at IUPUI has a checkered past. We had a troubled beginning. We had some bleak years early on. We weathered a lot of faculty opposition. But over the years, we made progress, and that has accelerated in recent years. And I've learned a lot about what it takes to make the case and make progress with an e-portfolio initiative in no small part from coming to ABLE conferences. So as you could see on the mission statement, it is almost all about students. It focuses on empowering students supporting learning, especially integrative learning, supporting student success, learning from e-portfolios about who we are as a program or institution, which I view as a form of assessment. It speaks to values that most of us share as educators. It's aligned with IEPY's campus mission, vision, and current strategic plan. And it took us a mere 17 years to reach this point with our ePortfolio initiative. So what I'd like to do today is first give you a very condensed history of the ePortfolio initiative at IEPY, say a little bit about how the mission task force came to be, then spend most of my time discussing the work that we did in the task force and the way that we focused our discussions, and finally say something about the impact of the task force and mission statement thus far. So IEPY um, started its ePortfolio initiative very early in 2000, 2001. There were very few models at the time of successful institutional adoption. Is this not good? All right. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Is this better? No. Yes. <laughs> How about this? Yes. Okay, uh, should I go back to the beginning? <laughs> well, okay, so back in 2000, 2001, there were very few models of successful institutional adoption of e-portfolios. And those that existed were at very different kinds of institutions institutions that were able to more or less develop a single model for using e-portfolios where everybody was doing pretty much the same thing. That wouldn't work at our institution. We're a large research campus with 18 schools. We have more than 350 academic programs that run the gamut of disciplines, undergraduate programs, graduate professional programs, graduate academic graduate research programs. Some of them are IU programs, some of them are Purdue programs. The IU programs have different kinds of relationships with counterpart programs at other IU campuses. There are at least three different models for IU campuses, uh, IU programs organization and relationships with the rest of IU. So having a single model for e-portfolio adoption just was not something that was going to work. 
for us. But we tried it anyway. We made some very naive, we made some very naive mistakes. We thought we could tell people what a great thing this would be and they would see the light and they would start using e-portfolios in ways that were valuable to students, to faculty, to the institution as, as a whole, to programs. That did not happen. So um, in fall 2004, we got a little bit of money together. And at this point, the IT people told us that the platform was ready. We were helping to develop the platform. It was an open source uh, portfolio. And we quasi conscripted some faculty, uh, giving them a little, little bit of money as an inducement. Uh, faculty who taught the first year seminar and the first year writing course, because that's what you'd want to do, right? You'd want students to start the e-portfolio in their freshman year, and you'd want them to continue it through graduation. So that was logical, but it was not smart. The software, as it turned out, was crude, as was most e-portfolio software back in 2004. We really didn't know that much about e-portfolios. Um, I, I should say that at this point, I was not the director, but I was very involved. Uh, we provided very little faculty development, and we talked too much about assessment of our general education outcomes, and not enough about student development and empowerment. So even though the idea originated in a faculty committee, the e-portfolio came to be perceived as a top-down imposition of assessment. Uh, that really was not very good for the initiative, although it, it was good that we had administrative support and funding. Um, so the e-portfolio was not used in a meaningful way. In those courses where it was included, it was treated as an add-on. It was certainly not treated as a high-impact practice. Uh, it was an extra. The students hated it, in large part because of the software, which was constantly crashing. Um, as did the initiative uh, after that initial pilot. So we really had to uh, regroup and develop a new strategy. And we kind of went underground for a few years while we continued to uh, work with the IT people to develop the software. Uh, we did continue to have a budget and administrative support. So we adopted a much more laissez-faire approach, a sort of let a thousand flowers bloom strategy where we used money as an incentive. We began giving small grants to academic programs that saw a need that e-portfolios could address for them. Very often that need was an assessment need. Um, and as we were working with those early adopters, we provided lots of professional development. We were starting to learn more ourselves about e-portfolios. Uh, a lot of hand-holding with the software, which was still uh, very unintuitive. By now, I was the director. Now, I'm in 2006, 2007 or so. We solicited advice from those early adopters about what they needed the e-portfolio to do. And we fed that advice back to the IT people who began to incorporate those features into the software. In 2009, 2010, we finally got a more easily usable presentation capability. And at that point, we saw an acceleration of adoption and in particular, we began to see the e-portfolio being used in a more um, pedagogical, developmental way in some of the first year seminar sections, in several capstones. Uh, I taught a capstone, I too taught a capstone myself in the English program with uh, another faculty member. We use the e-portfolio. We started to see adoption in graduate programs, in co-curricular. 
um, activities. And we also developed an annual report that we very conscientiously aligned with the current strategic plan at the institution. We were still, we were still haunted by the bad reputation of the software from the 2004 pilot. Um, those stories tend to linger for a long time at campuses, as I'm sure many of you know. But three years ago, we bought a new, easier to use platform at the same time that we changed our LMS. So then we had something that looked like this. I just thought I would let you all take in the enormity of that for a second. <laughs> um, so not quite a thousand flowers and actually not quite 64. Uh, that's as of the end of 2017. So a year ago, we probably had uh, around 57, 58 e-portfolio projects going on around the campus. Now you have to remember, we have 350 academic programs. So this is by no means a majority, but it is a substantial amount of use. And the e-portfolio is being used in the first year seminar in the psychology department, which is, which is the largest major on the campus, in some high impact practices. So many students were touching it at some point. During this period, there were also some crucial national developments. ABLE was founded in 2009-2010. We funded a lot of people to come to the ABLE conferences. It was a big chunk of our budget, but it was one of the most important strategic steps we took. The conferences helped us to make the case that IUPUI was part of a large community of institutions attempting this work. A couple of other things that happened. We joined uh, cohort six of the International Coalition for Electronic Portfolio Research. And we also joined the Connect to Learning project led by LaGuardia Community College. We had a number of other faculty and staff involved in both of those initiatives. So we had people learning a lot at this point. Um, and our internal discussions on campus were becoming increasingly sophisticated in parallel with conversations at the ABLE conference and the AACNU ePortfolio Forum and other ga gatherings. But the initiative had, had evolved project by project. We had all these projects that were doing somewhat different things with ePortfolios. And it was hard to talk about the purpose of the ePortfolio initiative as a whole. And there was one particular meeting with the IT organization about the ePortfolio platform, the new one we, we had gotten in 2014. They were paying for it. And they were saying that they didn't understand the purpose of the ePortfolio initiative at IUPY. So I conferred with my colleagues in academic affairs uh, who were very supportive. We're fortunate now to have an executive vice chancellor who's used the ePortfolio herself and gets it. And we decided that we needed a mission statement and that we needed to constitute a mission task force. So we took a very a strategic approach to choosing the members of this task force and to guiding and facilitating its work. We had 12 members that was small enough to encourage discussion and engagement and participation by everybody, but big enough to have represent, representation of key e-portfolio constituencies and key campus constituencies. Some of the members were what I call power users, who had been using the ePortfolio for quite a long time and were very experienced, often in multiple context, contexts. One person, for example, had used it in the first year seminar and was also using it for prior learning assessment. We had four department chairs or program directors. We had a range of disciplines and schools. We had a, a representative from faculty governance. 
So um, uh, th this was a very good group, as it turned out. And we had a charge that we developed for the task force. This is just a bit of it, but it's the crux of it. We were asked to craft a mission and vision statement for the ePortfolio initiative that succinctly states why ePortfolios are important to IEPY, how ePortfolios are aligned with the campus vision, mission, and current strategic priorities, and that can guide the initiative in planning, defining priorities, and shaping programs. So, um, the task force met, met monthly for six months. Um, we had a definite endpoint. We had a due date for the mission statement. We used a seminar structure where we gave people suggested readings, short pieces, uh, most of them written by people in this room, um, short pieces to provoke discussion. And our early meetings were very much focused on discussion of e-portfolios, um, the pedagogical value of e-portfolios, curriculum, um, high impact practices. By the fourth month, we began bringing drafts of a mission statement to the meetings. So we had something to work with and we refined that over the successive meetings so that people saw that we were accomplishing something and that we were moving toward the end point. All right, so um, now, um, now I get to the, uh, the real crux of this, I think. Um, and that is what we actually talked about in this task force. Are you all hearing me well? Or Okay. I think I might be waving the mic around a little bit in, in my excitement. <laughs> Our discussions were wide-ranging. We talked about how we could use ePortfolios to support deeper, more engaged, integrated learning. We talked about the implications of ePortfolios for transforming curriculum and pedagogy. Someone said something in the second meeting that really struck me. We were talking about the use of ePortfolios to support self-authorship, which is something we've talked about a lot in the ePortfolio world over the years, and, and something we've talked a lot about at IUPUI over the last seven or eight years. Uh, someone said, is identity development part of the curriculum? And that was a very crystallizing moment for me. Um, that is really a fundamental question about the purposes of higher education. And I think that in some ways we were assuming that identity development was part of the curriculum. But that's not something that everybody at the institution would necessarily agree on. Um, in some ways, we've moved toward a much more technocratic, utilitarian concept of the purpose of higher education. So um, I, I think it was important that we brought this question out in a very clear way. I think for the members of the task force, identity development was part of the curriculum, but um, not necessarily true for uh, some of our professional programs, for example, at the institution. In, in my view, if we want our students to succeed, given who our students are, given who our students are at any institution, really, identity development has to be part of the curriculum. If you're not figuring out who you are, if your education isn't influencing who you are, if your education is not in some way transformative, then I think we're missing a point in higher education. Another question that came up, what is ePortfolio pedagogy? Um, 
we had a designated skeptic, I believe, in the group. He was from the IT unit, and I think that he was sent in to be skeptical. And I said something about e-portfolio pedagogy, and he said, do we even know what that is? I said, yes. <laughs> I happen to have on my iPad, which I carry with me at all times, it's my technological prosthetic. This is the standard slide that I use when I give e -port, uh, workshops on e-portfolios, on e-portfolio pedagog pedagogy. So I'm going to say a little bit about this now. Um, this is a very, very condensed version of what e-portfolio pedagogy is. Uh, ideally, e-portfolio pedagogy engages students in, me in metacognition and constructing knowledge and in becoming aware of that knowledge construction process as it's happen happening or after it's happened. It engages students in making connections, integrating learning from different contexts, it involves self-authorship as students develop evolving representations of themselves in their e-portfolio. It involves agency over learning as a fundamental outcome of students' experience with the e-portfolio. And it involves social pedagogy in which students engage with one another and with authentic, other authentic audiences. So, uh, some of the other questions and themes that we took up. How can e-portfolios help faculty and students develop integrated, coherent, guided pathways through programs, giving students the maximum opportunity to see how their various learning experiences are connected with one another? What advantages does the E confer over a paper portfolio? What can we learn from e-portfolios about our students, our programs, our institutions? How do e-portfolios change our relationships with our students? I think that's something we don't really talk about a lot, but we need to talk about more. So um, we finally ended up with the mission statement uh, that you see before you. Um, the mission speaks to the work, uh, well, what we decided um, at the beginning, uh, there was a little bit of confusion about whether the mission statement was for the e-portfolio initiative specifically or for e-portfolios at IUPUI. So we came to the conclusion that the mission statement would speak to the work of the e-portfolio initiative and our very small staff, me and Susan Scott uh, sitting at the back of the room, um, we decided that the vision would speak to the ideal state of e-portfolios at IEPY. The statement begins with the campus mission, vision, and priorities and links the e-portfolio to those. It focuses on the value for students first, then on the value for programs and the institution. The values and strategies speak to some of the things that I had on my, uh, my first slide after the Beatles. Um, student learning, student development, student success, faculty and staff professional development, and expanding the institution's capacity for self-improvement. So we try to make the case in that mission statement that e-portfolios can help us make progress toward the campus mission and strategic priorities. That is the fundamental case that needs to be made in whatever context you're using e-portfolios. Tracy, you're looking at me funny. Can everybody, can you, can you still all hear me okay? All right, great.
<laughs> okay. So uh, once we had a good draft of the mission statement, which is pretty much the draft that you have, I was asked by the executive vice chancellor to go to all of the major campus governance committees and present the mission statement and talk about the work of the task force. And this was a ch chance for me to make the case anew with these important committees now armed with a mission statement developed by a broadly representative campus group. Going back to my comment earlier about asking people's advice in order to gain their support, when I went to these committees, I asked for their suggestions about how to improve the mission statement, and I asked for their endorsement. I got one minor suggestion from somebody on one of the committees to add two words to the mission statement, which I did. All of these presentations and discussions happened during the last two weeks of the spring semester. So I haven't really had much of a chance yet to see what the impact of this work has been. I'm sure I'll be back next year talking about that. But I've started to see some things creeping into documents and conversations that lead me to think that the task force and mission statement are helping us to make the case for e-portfolios at our institution. For example, our Associate Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education recently announced the formation of an institute for engaged learning within our division of undergraduate education. And it says that the purpose of the institute is to further enhance student academic achievement, identity development, retention, and persistence to timely degree completion. Well, I've never seen the phrase identity development in any official campus document before, and it's certainly the first time I've seen it used in an official document in conjunction with academic achievement, retention, and persistence. Um, I'm not sure exactly where this came from. The Associate Vice Chancellor for Undergraduate Education was on three of those committees that I presented to. I've had conversations with him uh, but he also works closely with my colleague, Kathy Byarski, who leads the use of the ePortfolio in the first year seminar. So I talked to Kathy a little earlier in the conference, and I asked her if she knew where this came from, and she didn't. So it's kind of a mystery until we get a chance to uh, ask uh, this executive, uh, this uh, associate vice chancellor, but... Um, this is a very interesting development, I think. Um, I have even heard the suggestion that something about identity development be added to our principles of undergraduate learning. Now, this is just conversation. We have had these six principles of undergraduate learning for a long time with a few updates now and then. Personal development is in our co-curricular outcomes, intrapersonal and interpersonal development. But maybe we shouldn't be outsourcing that development to the co-curriculum. We want learning from the formal curriculum and the co-curriculum to be connected. We talk all the time about students integrating their learning experiences in and out of class. This, I think, would be an important point of connection. So I'm going to say a little bit about what I think worked well about this task force. Um, I, I'm certainly feeling optimistic now about the future of ePortfolios at IUPUI. Um, the fact that we had a chief academic officer who understands ePortfolios was certainly invaluable. She came to the first meeting and gave us our charge. Um, the seminar style structure with a cross-disciplinary collegial group who enjoy discussing teaching, learning, and curriculum, 
the readings, um, it, that was really important. The fact that we had a critical mass of people who were well informed and experienced with e-portfolios. The fact that our, dis our discussions focused on teaching and learning, not on technology and not on assessment per se, although we did talk about what we could learn about our students and programs from ePortfolios. There was a lot of enthusiasm. The discussions were very high level, um, very interesting. Uh, people were really engaged. Um, it was fun. We looked forward to the meetings. I, I well, I did, and I believe others did too. Also, ePortfolios speak to the current moment and current thinking about higher education and how higher education needs to change. I find that conversations about ePortfolios and the curriculum and the purposes of higher education, well, I find that conversations about ePortfolios portfolios often turn into conversations about the purposes of higher education. E-portfolios are, at their essence, a way of serving the purposes of higher education. And most of us love to talk about that. I think the ways in which we set forth the purposes of e-portfolios through those early readings and presentations fit the larger context of the institution right now, fit with our strategic plan. When we talk about e-portfolio pedagogy as that has been defined, we are attending to the development of educated human beings, thoughtful, self-aware people who know what they don't know. We don't have enough of those people right now. The idea of e-portfolios and identity also captures people's imaginations, I believe, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level, where faculty are, are interested in, in helping students develop not only their own personal identity, but also a professional identity um, as you move into the graduate uh, programs. The members functioned as colleagues, not as representatives of disciplines, or special interests, although many of them were there to represent a specific con constituency. The discussions fit the larger campus context right now. We have a strategic plan that was developed through a campus-wide process. It has a lot of ownership, and it puts student learning and success as the institution's highest priority. So I'm going to make a few observations to finish up. Um, I don't think we could have had the discussions that we had at IEPY until the ePortfolio initiative had reached a certain level of maturity. But that doesn't mean that this would not be a useful exercise for a newer ePortfolio initiative. I think this is something that we'll have to revisit periodically, and, and that would be true at just about every campus. Um, we balance representative uh, representation of key constituencies with e-portfolio expertise. We had senior and newer people. Um, we were very collegial. As I said, we avoided turf wars. We were not prescriptive. We gave people readings, but we let the group own the process to ensure that they also owned the product. Um, my experience is that you have to keep making the case for e-portfolios. And I, this has been, I think, very helpful to us and will continue to be very helpful to us as we move along into a bright future, I hope. So, the end. <laughs> Hi, I'm from Yes, everybody knows I always have a question. Um, so, actually I don't necessarily have a question, but uh, more of a comment that 
I don't understand how education without self awareness can be effective. Um, and uh, I think that we see daily examples of what that's doing to our community and to other communities. Um, so I think that the most important, the most important things we can do as educators is help students develop self awareness, and we also need to practice it ourselves. So I think that it would be helpful if faculty remember that we're still on a learning journey. Um, and that we still have things to learn, and that we can practice these things along with our students, um, because then we can model it, and we can also understand some of the problems that they encounter. Um, and I really appreciate all of the talks that I've heard about making things personal. Um, I have a prototype on Pebblepad that I give my students to make changes to in their e-portfolio, um, but I was saying just before that I want to have them do a personal page to get used to the technology. And it's like way less um, intimidating, and they can just build it, and then they can work on it over the year, and then they can add it to their portfolio, and it makes it more meaningful, and so they can make connections. With them. And I don't think school is the place where you go to get knowledge; it's where you go to get tools for thinking about knowledge and integrating, integrating into your life and encountering difference. So um, I really like that e-portfolios are a place where people. Um, end up talking about what are, what's the value of higher education, what are we supposed to do in, in education. And I don't think it's a bad thing that we have to keep making the case um, because that keeps our brains fresh about why it's important. Comment? I, I agree. <laughs> Susan, uh, it was during the intro, it was talked about the fact you're also involved in your accreditation reports. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe connect? some of the presentation that you just gave with your accreditation reports and see or create some bridges because I'm assuming there are and just didn't see in your presentation. <laughs> um, my experience has been that specialized accreditors are much more interested in seeing actual portfolios than regional accreditors. Um, we talk about e-portfolios as one of the assessment methods that we use in the report, but um, it, we did at one time in 2002, we, we did have links to authentic examples of student work. Uh, we, we had a very complex website and institutional portfolio that was a part of our self-study. Um, I'm not sure how many of the team members really accessed it. I don't think regional accreditors get all that granular in terms of student learning. They want to know that you're assessing and they want to know that you're making improvements and closing the loop and so forth. Uh, we have had a number of instances, however, where specialized accreditors came in and looked at students' actual e-portfolios. So uh, I, I think that there is a much stronger uh, connection there. Um, I, I guess more broadly, I would say that e-portfolios can tell us a lot about how students are experiencing the curriculum, how they're experiencing our programs, how they're experiencing our institutions. And I believe that much of that, much of that information is actionable. They, they also tell us a lot about how e-portfolios, um, they, they tell us a lot about how students are making sense of what we're trying to teach them at any given point. So they can illuminate points of confusion or, or things that students are struggling with, I think they can help us in our teaching in that way as well. Um, but as for the accreditation context, um, yeah, I, I really think that it's the specialized accreditors who are, who are interested in seeing that kind of detail on student learning and student experience. Hi, thank you. 
Um, at our institution, there's been um, some conversation about getting rid of the EE, just calling it portfolio. And I noticed that up on one of your slides, you have the question, why the EE portfolio? And I was hoping that you could speak to that from <laughs> I believe that e-portfolios involve a different thought process than paper portfolios. If you think of e-portfolios as personal academic websites, which is pretty much how I think of them, although uh, there are other ways of approaching them, but a website is a knowledge structure. It includes narrative. It includes discussion of what's here and, and why it's here. Why, why am I showing you this? It includes hyperlinks. It includes menus. Um, it includes non-written elements. It includes uh, design that students need to think about, um, hopefully that is a reflective process when students choose the way that they want their portfolio to look, when students choose images to add to their e-portfolio, when they choose video. Um, I've come across portfolios that had a soundtrack. Uh, that is another occasion for reflection. So I think that building a portfolio website involves iterative reflection. It requires creating, a, I mean, sometimes students need to be told this, uh, especially um, less experienced students, but a website should have some coherence. So ideally, as students build an e-portfolio website, they are thinking about how this all makes sense as part of an integrated whole. And that's something that you can also ask them to be reflecting about and thinking about. Um, so you can make that a very deliberate process. But um, that's kind of how I would sum it up. Uh, linear portfolios tend to, uh, written portfolios tend to be much more linear, um, it's a notebook. A website is not a notebook. It, it's a very different kind of thing that requires a different kind of thinking from both students and faculty. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, Oscar Fernandez from University Studies. Over here, Susan. Oh, thank, you. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing your remarks about the process. So I have a question about process. If in the process your committee and your committees included language about equity inclusion as you were forming your mission statement. That's something that I continue to see lacking in your portfolio pedagogy and thinking about um, your portfolio. The way I teach and I teach here at PSU is I see the portfolio as a really deep tool where students can really engage deeply with questions about equity, inclusion, cult different cultures, multi languages. So um, I'm wondering if that entered into the conversation discussions about equity, multi-ethnic students, multilingual students. And thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Um, that's a great question. Um, that is part of our strategic plan. Um, uh, we are certainly very interested in giving all students access to high impact practices. Um, we are continually diversifying our campus in terms of the student body, the faculty, and so forth. Truthfully, I don't think, I mean, I, I think that is a value that just about everybody on the committee holds. But truthfully, I don't think we had much explicit discussion of it. There are a couple of people in the room who are on the task force. Um, would you like to add anything to that? Maybe you remember something better than I do. Well, I think you, you provide an excellent um, framing up the task force. And I think that student ownership, identity, and agency are, are clear um, values. And to, to our colleagues' uh, point here, we could probably have done a better job of programming that as an explicit. Uh, yeah. Agency. But I think it was threaded you know, uh, 
well the discussion perhaps interesting. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, it's a great point. Thank you. I'm getting all the questions from this side of the room, but I'm happy I'm happy to go over that way too. So. Were any students included in the task force? No. Question. Was there a reason for that, Susan? Um, it, it is relatively uncommon at IUPY. I, I think that grows out of the fact that we're a commuter campus. Um, it has historically been very difficult to get good student participation, consistent participation on committees. And I don't want to say we've given up on it. Um, we certainly got a lot of student input to our strategic plan, for example. Uh, we do a lot of surveying of students. Um, we are very interested in getting student perspectives. Most of the faculty who use ePortfolios get a lot of feedback from their students. I regularly visit classes where students are talking about their ePortfolios. So I do hear a lot of that perspective, but um, we have students who tend to have complicated, busy lives. Uh, many of them work, many of them have families um, and responsibilities beyond being a student. Um, this is one of the reasons that we want students to develop a strong academic identity, in fact. Um, so that, that is the reason. It, it is uh, simply not very common at IUPUI to do that, although everybody knows that we, we want to bring student perspectives in to the extent that we can. I think we've got time for one or two more questions if anyone would like to have the microphone. Oh. I'm in the middle, at least. <laughs> Hi, um, you talked earlier about uh, the one question that was posed, is identity development part of the curriculum? And that's a question that I've been working through with one program at the university I work at. Um, and I'm wondering what sort of areas or components of identity development were part of this, um, you know, if, you know, if this did become part of the curriculum, was recognized as part of the curriculum or, or became part of it. Um, one of the key elements that uh, my program has been struggling with was uh, moving into having a web presence as a student. Uh, to what degree are these students ready to become not anonymous, become a person identifiable on the web. And this is a, a program that's made career professional. So there's a conflict or tension with, I'm already a person at work. And I don't know if I want my critiques of this, that, the other thing, being this place everybody can find. Well, I think you've got a few different questions in there. Um, Well, I, I will say that like most ePortfolio platforms, ours allows students to have multiple versions of their ePortfolios, um, multiple pages that they can rearrange in different ways. Um, it enables students to keep their portfolios as private or make them as public as possible. So students have a great deal of control over the way that their making themselves visible to the rest of the world. Um, and the ways in which they're making themselves visible to um, various kinds of people who might look at their ePortfolio. You might not include your most personal reflections in the version of the ePortfolio that you have linked to your resume or your LinkedIn page. Um, so I, 
I think that is certainly an important issue, student privacy. Um, we're talking about um, how portfolios might be related to the um, student record project that Tom Black talked about where one of the campuses in that. Um, and we certainly would not want to link what students wrote in their freshman year um, about, you know, who they were, you know, we, we allow, students have a great deal of control over how they're presenting themselves. Um, and um, have I answered your whole question? <laughs> what I was wondering was about in the process of the program, <laughs> are there opportunities to pause and think about how much I'm letting out there now or what I'm putting out there now and if I develop, do I want to change? Am I now, do I want to be more out there? And sort of the flip side of that, especially in a professional program is, does being a person in this profession mean that you, you do have to be out there, that you're connected right. with other people via social media, on the internet, and as part of being a person who does that sort of thing, and how do you grow into uh, being comfortable with that? My experience with students is that they have a wide range of responses to that. Um, in using the ePortfolio in the English capstone, I find that there are students who are much more reserved, um, even with, within the confines of the class even when only the class can see their e-portfolios. Um, other students are um, much more comfortable with putting themselves out there and being personal. You see that on social media. Um, so I, I can't give you a general answer about the program because we have all these different e-portfolio initiatives uh, we certainly, in our professional development, talk about that and encourage faculty to make students aware of their options and to be thinking about curating the presentation of their identity in their e-portfolios. Um, Susan, did you want to add something to that? Thanks. Uh, the term identity development is, is purposely uh, pretty general and ambiguous because there are certain components there. If you have heard or read any of Kathy Mayarsky's work, for instance, you know that um, a fundamental part of the electronic personal development plan that I made, the first your seminars and beyond, is, is to focus on a student's sort of personal academic identity. At the same time, many of our majors, our program majors, are focusing on developing, uh, beginning to develop a professional identity. Uh, or if that didn't happen for some at the undergraduate level, it's happening in a number of master's level professional programs, where, where the, the emphasis it really is almost entirely on uh, professional Development or professional identity, and, and that's something that, in fact, uh, many of our health sciences programs or, or professional programs in the street, uh, we don't have pharmacy, but I've noticed it across the country and others like that, where, where you know, suddenly e portfolios are a wonderful way to deal with the um, uh, increasing attention expected from specialized accreditors about, uh, you know, the, the sort of soft skills that are part of being a physician or an attorney or whatever. So, so there's that aspect, and in that case, maybe it makes it's, it's clearer how it can be part of the curriculum. Kathy? I don't want to get us too, down a rat, too far down a rabbit hole, but I want to say this because I'm very excited about it. Well, <laughs> excuse me. We're in the process of writing a grant where we're going to use e-portfolios as a way to help traditionally underserved, underrepresented students in the 
sciences develop, kind of process the negative messages they may be receiving, gain the efficacy, and develop identity as a scientist, as a retention and success strategy to get more students into the sciences. And so we're starting to think about how that reflective writing can interpret, help them interpret some of the things they may be experiencing at the institution. And instead of them walking away from the sciences, become more committed to it. And I should say, in case it wasn't clear that uh, Kathy is from IUPUI, um, she leads the um, work on ePortfolio that's taking place in the first year seminar and, and beyond the first year seminar in some of our programs. And was on the task force, yes, thank you. Key member of the task force. I just want to make a comment on your question about students sharing their most vulnerable um, learning and identity components as they transform. So I think one of the best things you can think about is the um, platform. So I don't know about a lot of the platforms out there, but the one that we use allows people to, or allows students to create many portfolios if they want. So if they have one big, <laughs> concept portfolio that's their whole four years, at any point they can make copies of it and then remove pieces and parts that they don't want to share publicly. And then they decide how and when and who they share whichever portfolios they want to share. So that allows them to create one that would be connected to their LinkedIn or their resume and just have maybe some writing examples of best work or things like that, but not have their vulnerable journaling because they could remove that, but still keep that original big portfolio. Great. Thank you so much for those um, questions, and thank you so much, Susan, for this fantastic talk. I think our hope um, in asking you to do this was that you would um, embody the kind of thinking and practice that Trent and Judy really hoped to see in ABLE. Your work at IUPUI certainly has done that, and you have lived out that mission and vision that they had for the organization throughout. So please join me in thanking Susan.